All right. Good evening and welcome to the final session. Sessions. So a little bit of, um, I guess, cleaning up before, cleaning up before we tear it all down. Um, a reminder that to get all assignments in to me as uh, soon as possible, the uh, participation assignments are closing soon. Um, all the other assignments will close as well. When any of those assignments close, I will not accept anything late barring extremely extenuating circumstances. So get all of those things into me. If there is something going on, let me know. Um, all of the participation assignments, by the way, also able to be redone. So if you'd like to bump your grade up more, that might be the first place to go is make sure you got tens instead of eights or nines or sevens. Um, as far as with the, um, the presentation aspect, it took me too long and trying to figure it out. And honestly, halfway through, I just kind of just threw my hands up with it. So I will be publishing that as an extra credit thing. So if you want to submit, you know, whether you have a presentation done already, or if you would like to do it, um, I will give you, you may earn up to 25 extra, extra credit, extra credit points that will go towards your overall grade. Professor Straub. So, um, that, that should be published um, by Wednesday morning, that assignment. So if you, so if you want to take advantage of that, you are more than welcome to. Professor uh, Straub. Of course, we'll talk about the final exam uh, at the end, at the very end of it all. Any other questions as far as um, any of those things, as far as just, you know, housekeeping and whatnot? Professor Straub. Hold on a second. I barely hear you. Yes? Uh, yeah. Uh, so basically, so I've already had my uh, pistols paper submitted. So are you saying there won't be a video? We don't have to do a video presentation for it now? Yes. You do not have to do it. I will be opening it up since since it's, it's so late and that I that I set it all up. I'm not gonna. I know you're already overwhelmed enough with probably other things you got to do. So, if you want to do it, you can do it and you can get extra credit for it. But it will not be it will not be required. Okay. Um, and then since you said the participation, I seen that you popped the last one up uh, around yes. like two or three. So with that one, since the rest will close. The 23rd, well, and that one's due the 27th. Do we have until still for the 27th to submit that one? Since you have until the, until the date posted on there. Okay. All and the then, assignments have have a, a closed a date. I think okay. like all the particip participation assignments, except this week's um, week 15, are Friday the 23rd. I think I, I gave you until next Tuesday, I think, for that. And so, since my last question, so basically, since we won't have to do the video unless we want to do it for extra credit uh when will will the will that still be worth the the paper still be worth the same amount of points and will the, we just have the to paper, wait the paper will still be the same amount of points it'll be 50 points. okay and do we just have to wait for that to be graded at the end of the that, that should be graded by the end of this week uh, okay I kind of started that um it should be great all everything that i have of yours should be graded by the end of this week okay give it to me later whatnot all right, thank you. Other questions? Like I said, we'll talk about the final exam at the very end. Of course, for now, we need to talk about the end of ends. The very last book in the New Testament, the very last book in the entire Bible itself, the book of Revelation. And I want to emphasize that. We talked at the beginning of this class about the principle or the idea of Revelation overall. How it is that God offers his self-communication to humanity, of which the, the highlight or the greatest way he does that is the scriptures. That is not what we're talking about when we mean the book of Revelation. We are meaning here the last book in the Bible, the last book in the New Testament. 
And it is appropriate that it is the last book, not in implying that it is the latest book to be written, but more importantly, because it talks about the end of all things. And that great phrase, the apocalypse, right? Or some, sometimes even like, of the apocalypse or the Armageddon, right? Many will say that Christians can at times be too focused or too um, desirous of these you know, last days, these last times. But it is something that has been inherent in pretty much every religion or culture throughout history. Understanding that there is some way in which everything begins, and hence if there is some sort of beginning, there must be some sort of end. If societies can rise, they can fall. If human beings are born, they die. How much more so humanity collectively or the universe collectively? So we see examples such as in Norse mythology, the idea of Ragnarok, as they called it. The end battle, the gods battling among themselves, and above all, battling with Loki, the god of, of mischief and chaos. All these sorts of creatures, supernatural creatures, or you know, excessive creatures all fighting against each other. Almost everyone is killed on both sides. And the last survivor, the one, the one left, he puts it all out. I mean, literally burns up the rest of the universe. The stars fall, the sun dims, the ocean covers the earth, which is interesting. Many of these things talk about start and end with water. There are ideas such as Zoroastrianism, an ancient Persian or modern day Iran. Uh, religion they believe the world was in it was in a perpetual duel between good and evil that there are two equal forces that there would have to be a final battle and then a purification of the world along with perhaps some thoughts of, of resurrection of the dead native americans had uh, a ghost dance that supposedly foretold the resurrection of the dead of all their dead warriors, of all their dead tribesmen, and that the purging of the Europeans, the white man would be driven out from their lands. So that, you know, kind of, kind of a one last restoration. It is this ghost dance, by the way, that influenced, for those familiar in American history, that influenced the massacre at Wounded Knee. That the, the, many in, in the US Army were afraid of these ghost dancers and whatnot, and that preemptively killed many of them. And yet this is not just a concern in a religious aspect, it's, it is concern in a cultural aspect as well. We see a lot of apocalyptic films, right? That portray things falling apart or degrading one way or the other. What might be some examples of that? 2012. 2012 was probably the big one, kind of the, um, because you know, supposedly the Mayan calendar was coming to an end and that was their thought that that was going to be the end of the world on that. And no, it really wasn't. An end of an era, but that's a different thing. Others? No other recent ones come to mind? What was one of uh, the day after tomorrow? All the, the climate, you know, goes on such a, a, a bend that it all goes crazy. There are um, various scientific theories that postulate, you know, just as there must have been a big bang that initiated, began this universe in some way, there must be some end towards which it is leading. Some say just as it expanded out, it will contract, you know, contract again what they call the big crunch. Some will say uh, that it will all um, 
the, the heat energy will dissipate out so much that we'll basically freeze beyond it. Yeah, makes me always think of a great poem by Robert Frost, Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who go with fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I might enough of ice. To say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. So there's always this thought, this, this underlying recognition that the center cannot hold. Not, it cannot be, everything cannot be maintained as it is now. Whether just on a personal level, whether on a communal level, on a societal level, a cultural level, on a universal level. It's all winding down. So, how is it then that this book of Revelation is perhaps so different or unique in its own perspective? Well, we need to understand its place and its significance within the New Testament and therefore within Christianity. First of all, this is not its original title. This is the Latin title, Revelatio, Liber Revelationis. Its original title, or what is known by in the Greek, is Apocalypsis. This is, by the way, why we get the word apocalypse or apocalyptic. Not from the meaning of the word itself, but from its, its association, association with this last book, this book of doom and gloom and peril and destruction and downfall. Hence, things are apocalyptic if they're that way. But both of these words, Revelatio from the Latin, Apocalypsis from the Greek. Both of them have the same meaning in their basic, in their root understanding. They mean an unveiling. Revelatio, to pull back the veil. The action of pulling back the veil. Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis was a type of veil. So what this book is meant to be is not necessarily a prophecy. It's not meant to be a prophecy in the sense that all the other prophecies that we saw in the Old Testament were. An apocalypse, a book like the book of Revelation, is meant to demonstrate, is meant to show for us what is to come. Of old in theaters, not just live theaters, but even movie theaters. When the curtain rose, you knew something was about to start. You knew the, the action was beginning. The film is rolling. That's what this, that's what calling it a revelatio or apocalypsis means. We're going to be seeing by reading, by going through this to understand and to see what is to come. So to Describe, to, to use the word apocalypse in a broader sense, not just for this book, but just this type of literature, this type of literature that concerns the, the end of time, the end of humanity, the end of the universe. An apocalypse in general is a genre of revelatory literature that has a narrative framework in it, in which a revelation, you know, an unveiling, occurs and is mediated in some way, whether through a human being or another worldly being, an angel, God, the God or the gods themselves, disclosing some sort of transcendent reality 
that is both temporal, and it talks about something going on in the passage of time, but also spatial. It not only involves this world, but it involves perhaps another world or a future world. It is this type of literature that gives rise to the great study of the end, of the last things, what is called eschatology. We brought this up in talking about um, the last days of Jesus because he has a discourse that is called the eschatological discourse, talking about these sort of last things. This comes from us from the word, the Greek word eschaton, which means sort of the last or the newest. So the eschaton are the last things. Or in a sense, you can say the newest things. What's the most newest in, in the passage of time? That which exists at the end of time. I said it's distinct from prophecy. These apocalypses um, are distinct from prophecies because a prophecy can kind of go for, back, talking about the past, talking about the present, or talking about the future. Whereas an apocalypse is always looking towards the future, solely and completely looking towards the future. What is to come? Maybe relating it to what must happen maybe here and now, but not less of revealing things that are here and now. These apocalypses, not just the not just the book of Revelation, but any type of apocalypse, can be classified according to its content, whether it's otherworldly or not. There are various types where one is taken up, you know, to a, you know, a different spiritual realm, you know, the, the heavens or something like that. Whereas others, as we will see in, in the book of Revelation, are just visions of what will happen. It's not, it's not like a, a movement of the individual. It may be classified according to what it is referring to. It may be personal and that it relates to you know, the end or the goal or what is going to happen to an individual or a couple of individuals. It may be considered ethnic or national in that it go it, it deals with you know, larger groups, you know, not just necessarily like even a family, but even a collection of peoples. Or it can involve all the entire world. So be classified on a cosmic scale. Now, this type of talk on focusing on things that are eschatological or apocalypses are not merely found in the book of Revelation. This is not the only place. We already saw one example of that in the eschatological discourse of Jesus, or what is sometimes called as the little apocalypse. Revealing and highlighting all those things in the, in the days before his passion, his death, and his resurrection. The, uh, there's an example in the, excuse me, in the Old Testament, in the book of the prophet Daniel. There are a series of four visions at which Daniel is assisted in seeing them by some sort of angel, sometimes asked whether it's even Gabriel, the Archangel Gabriel, of things to come in, in the days after Daniel. Things such as describing what is known as an abomination of desolation appearing in the temple. 
saying that, you know, there, that 70 weeks will pass for the coming of the one who will undo all of this. Or make it right, I should say. Of course, meaning the Messiah. So not just in the preaching and teaching of Jesus, not just in the Old Testament either. St. Paul talks about this as a bent looking towards the future. This specific event he often calls this the parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, -A, the parousia. That time that when, you know, just as Jesus departed from the earth, we talk about his ascension, the last moments of his personal presence here on earth, that Jesus will return once more, what's often what's called in simpler language, the second coming, the second coming of Christ or the second coming of Jesus, that he will return and will make all things right. And calling his hearers to be ready for that day. And it is soon, it is near at hand. It is this sort of language that then, you know, inspires the great, uh, inspires many to you know, preach and proclaim the gospels. Why? Because they feel one way or another, the end is nigh. It's almost become kind of a, a, a gimmick thing in certain things, comics or TV shows or things like that. Someone hold up a sign, the end is nigh, the end is nigh. Nigh is just an, old, an older English word that means near, close, approaching. There is, of course, much truth to this. The end is near. It is nearer every single day. It perhaps may not be as near as Christians desire or want it to be, but it approaches each and every day. It is inevitable. When it will happen, the day or the hour is unknown except to the Father. When that, that time is reached, when it approaches, all things will begin. But of course, it's important for Christians to be aware of it. Hence why it is that God reveals this in the book of Revelation. You could say, in a sense, this is the final sort of self-revelation of God. Obviously, this is the last book. There are no more books in the Bible, no more books in the New Testament. There's nothing left after this book. Professor Straub. Yes, sir. Uh, I read and didn't it say what will sound the beginning is the trumpets? Yes. Is that basically like what, in a sense, they're saying how you would know that it would start no, 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 I mean, you know, the, the trumpet is one of the greatest means of grabbing attention. So obviously they are used in this in this language to talk about that. But we'll see that as we continue to go along in the work. So some basic facts, first of all, on the book of Revelation. Who is it attributed to? There is someone you know, at the beginning who says, I, John. I, John, was at Patmos. Someone said to me, John. Tradition, Christian tradition, is normally said that this John is the same John who is the author of the fourth gospel. who is the 
one of the, one of, the of 12 apostles, John, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, who is also the one who wrote the three Joe nine letters or the three epistles of John. Modern scholarship remains divided on that. Some hold to that. Some will say it is a different John. <coughs> or some will say that it is attributed to the community founded by the Apostle John. So when they say I, John, they, they must mean some sort of plural we, a royal we, royal I instead of the singular I. But the, the, there are similarities. This book is attributed, is directed, I should say, towards seven different communities, or seven churches in the region of modern day Turkey, which, which would have been called Asia Minor back in those days. No, I will not make you memorize all seven churches, but the, the seven churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia or Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We know this also because John is, is, is told to write, as we'll see in looking at the overview of the work, John is told to write seven distinct letters, one, a letter to each one of these churches. He's encouraged in this vision that he has to write these letters. So at a minimum, this is the audience that he is directed towards. You can say in a wider sense, it is of course the overall Christian community. When is it written? It is said to have been written around the mid 90s. In some way, being written before the end of um, the reign of the emperor at that time, Emperor by the name of Domitian, or Domitian, who reigns to about the year 96. So early 90s, late 90s, but no, no later than 96. How do you spell that? D O M I T I A N. D O M I T I A N? U-M-I-T-I-A-N. Okay, thank you. It is a, it is a single work. It is not something that is um, compiled together Gospels, we could argue, maybe are compiled together, stories compiled together, one way or the other. It is, basic, it, is, it is basically a single work. It may have been done in stages, work on some of this, work, then work on some of this. It has a kind of epistolary uh, framework. Remember, we talked about the general frame or the general outline of all the epistles. It kind of has that. And not just, I mean, in the sense that it has you know, letters to, a letter to each of these churches. Just in its, in its overall work, we could say it almost kind of ties to the more Catholic letters that are not necessarily addressed to a specific audience or a specific community. What is its purpose? What is the goal or what is the 
what is the major theme? Now, some will automatically you know, step up and say, well, it's automatically theme is, is how the world will end. That's the whole point, right? Just how does the world end? That is not the actual major theme or purpose of this work. Its major purpose, its major theme can be summed up as encouragement. Middle E goes in there or not? Oh, well. Even I fall prey to needing autocorrect sometimes. The major theme, the major purpose is encouragement. In all of this, John is concerned with writing all of this so that those who are reading it, his audience, whether the, the direct audience or the indirect audience may be encouraged. Why? Because these Christians who are reading it are undergoing an immense persecution at this time that happened under the reign of the emperor Domitian. Forced to renounce, deny, the truths of their faith and conform to society, conform to the government or die or suffer in some way. And we know this because John uses numerous, in, in, in repetition, words of encouragement. The language that he uses Words such as hypomone, H Y P O M O N E, which means patience or endurance. Calling them, calling these seven churches, this happened seven times, to practice, to maintain hypom hypomone, this patience or endurance in the midst of trials. He uses quite a few times the word, the verb, krateo, K-R-A-T-E-O, at least Latin words, meaning to hold on, to endure, to hold fast. Another verb, Tereo, T-E-R-E-O, to keep, to maintain, to preserve. Keep the faith, preserve that faith, hold the faith. And along with it, talking most of all about those who belong among the Nikan. In I K A N, which translate as those who conquer, those who are victorious. So all of this, all of this language highlighting. Then why, is, then why is it that he's talking about his end times and all that? Because ultimately, what John is telling his audience, what the writer is telling his audience, is that in one sense, it's going to get worse. It will get worse before it gets better. But there will be something, 
to look forward to, especially for those who conquer, for those who gain victory. All of this that is happening, these persecutions, this hatred, this animosity towards these Christians is leading towards something better and greater. Though it will require more trials before that happens. Now, one thing that needs to be understood in talking about the book of Revelation is that what is shown what is demonstrated or what is revealed is not a hunt meant to be 100% taken literally. Many Christians throughout the centuries have, tried, have, have interpreted the book of Revelation in a hyper-literal way. That everything that is that is revealed in this book will happen exactly as it's revealed. Uh, there was uh, uh, there was a major wave of this, or, or a slight interpretation of this, uh, in the late '90s and early 2000s. Uh, what what was called the Left Behind series. That it was a, a series of, of, of Christian fiction that, that swept across the country. Uh, even inspired a few movies, a few variations of movies. Um, that is kind of, you know, seeing, seeing the experience of the apocalypse, the, the end times, and the perspectives of people living through it. There are, there are other ways that it comes out in something. But some of these things are not meant to be taken so hyper literal. For example, that the great battle that will occur, that there will be involved, you know, some sort of you know, cricket like soldier creatures who will be fighting in the midst of it. Bring up the passage here. But talking about uh, when the smoke came, locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions, not to hold anything in appearance. The locusts were like horses arrayed for battle. On their heads would look like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, their teeth like lion's teeth, scales like iron breastplates. plates, the noise of wings like the noise of many chariots, tails like scorpions, stings. It's a weirdly displayed army to come to come into attack. It is not meant to be taken hyper literal. So literal that everything is going to be spent, everything as it's exactly spelled out. Again, as of John, what was the biggest thing that highlighted the fourth gospel? The use of symbolic language. use of symbolic language. John has a deeper meaning when he writes some of these things. We will talk about that more in looking at it in our next session, our final session. This is our second to last session. 
But this work is not meant to be taken so hyper literal. It does reveal in some way what will happen in the end. But it should not, it should not be so looked into that you know we're just we're just checking off all right we got these uh scorpion like creatures we got this uh this dragon with uh there's a dragon here that has five heads that are dead one head that's alive and one head that's not yet been born yep that's here we're gonna check off all these things again symbolic language highlighting something that the reader would you know the, the immediate reader would understand well we who are a little bit more removed from the immediate circumstances need to understand it in that context, and what it's trying to say. So, let's at least look at an overall outline of what happens in this work. How does it look like? What, what, what all is going on? We, of course, have introduction and treat into everything. John introducing himself. There's kind of an initial um, vision. first kind of series or the first vision that John experiences, that he sees the risen Christ. He sees the risen Christ before him, who commands him to write those seven letters. So this is where we get those letters to the seven churches. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. But then there is, as it were, the first cycle of visions that John encounters. This is about four to Four to about the middle of 11, near the end of 11. So we see uh, we see in here, John kind of is taken up into heaven and he sees kind of the heavenly court. That there is the lamb reign supreme who is also sometimes called the lion of judah as well and in there the scroll with the seven seals now this could work in both a kind of a book format or a scroll format. I'm no artist, but overall. You cannot, you know, you cannot advance any further in this text, whether in a book format or a scroll format, more likely a scroll, without breaking a seal. This would be this would even be done. And you often see this in, in art, especially in, in images of the apocalypse. That there's a book and you know, there's these seals that are binding this book. You cannot go further. You cannot read more without breaking the seal. So it is that during this cycle of visions, John sees this scroll opening. In each of the seals, there are seven seals. Each of the seals are broken open and various events happen. Punishments and, and, and calamities 
on the earth, the gathering together of various peoples. This then spills over into the seven angels with their trumpets at the ready. Calling forth other varieties of calamities. But the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, signaling, as it were, the last battle and the last war that will be waged. John then kind of is pulled out of that a little bit before entering into the second cycle of visions. Which lasts from 12 to about the beginning of chapter 22. In this cycle, it begins with seven various visions of the past, of the present, and of the future. So it is in here, for example, that he talks about a woman clothed with the sun, the moon at her feet, a crown of stars on her head, bearing child, giving birth to this child, this child who will fight the dragon. Some sort of ancient serpent. It is in this one that we hear about the beasts, the various beasts, beast of the land and the beast of the sea. striving to have dominion over all of the earth. The calling forth in the midst of this, of a group of select people, only said to be the 144,000. And then after that, a group almost beyond counting We'll see some more later on. We see in here also seven various plagues that are poured out upon the earth. Great. The horsemen of the apocalypse, war, famine, death. But all of it leading to kind of the, the, the seven final visions that are truly of the final things. Beginning with the return of the Lamb. Who truly returns to be among his people. The Lamb who fights against his greatest enemy. The whore who is said to is the whore of Babylon. Who she is she is labeled as a whore, as one who has prostituted herself out to others. 
and is identified as Babylon, the great city. The Lamb and his army fight against this whore of Babylon and defeat her. Babylon falls. The final battle occurs. The great enemy of the Lamb is defeated. There is then said to be a, a, a millennial reign of the Lamb, a time of, of seeming peace and, and even in a certain sense, prosperity, I guess you could say. Then at last comes the final judgment. All will be set for the true and complete renewal of all things. And in fact, the Lamb says that, I make all things new. In this judgment, there are those who are, who are condemned, who are thrown down, with the beasts of the land of the sea, who are thrown down with the whore of Babylon, who are thrown down with the enemies of the land. But there are those who are called to join the Lamb and his heavenly court and all those with him. And indeed, all things are made new. There's the talk of the new heavens and the new earth. And above all, the new Jerusalem. What this looks like, what it means, and how it will be enjoyed. Lastly, there is, of course, just as there is an introduction, there is a conclusion or an epilogue. Things are brought to an end. A few prophetic sayings are offered by this John, and he, then he ends it with an, a sort of epistolary benediction, calling down God, calling down the Trinity to bless the reader who has heard this. shower down his blessing and his understanding on them so that they may be strengthened so that may, they may be able to benefit from these words Now that is kind of an overall understanding of what would happen. The greater means to dive into this, to understand more completely what all is happening with all of this is, is to break down and to look at the symbols that are used. You know, what are these beasts? What does he mean by that? Well, this dragon, this whore of Babylon, the lamb, the angels, the scroll, the new heavens and the new earth. What, what are all of these? What is their significance, their importance, their meaning? Why does John write in this way? Or how easily would his readers, his audience, have understood this that maybe we don't understand as well 
being far removed from the language, the culture, the times. We'll look at that, we'll, we'll explore that, we'll talk about that in our next session. A few comments, questions on any of this at this moment. Some of it, uh, much of it will probably be answered when we talk about the symbols more. Professor Straub. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I thought today was the last session. So next Tuesday is the last session? No, 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 we have one more. We're gonna do our usual Tuesday night. We're gonna take a break and then have another session. No, oh. I meant next next Tuesday. No, 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 we're not having the next Tuesday. Oh, okay, yeah, because I thought you said earlier like we'd have one more and I was just like, wait, I thought today was the last session. I always do this, I always think of this as kind of two two periods. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was like, hold up. I was like, next week is final. So I was like, we have one more? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Apology for the confusion. Do not panic. This, this is the last day you have to attend class. Other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, wishes, desires, fears, hopes? I wish to be done free. Welcome to the club. <laughs> All right, so we'll pause there. Um, we'll take a break and then we'll come back. Look at the symbols, you know, how do the symbols help us understand what is happening in, in this book of Revelation? And then prepare for the end ourselves. <laughs>